provost at the time said, you know, stand up and then one third of you sit down and these all, most of the rest of you are going to be gone. And I looked around and said, really, this is your attitude. So I think the good news is universities have come forward with a variety of approaches. G'day and welcome to Wellbeing. I'm Jack Hodgins. Today we are discussing student wellbeing in universities. We are joined by John Fischetti, a professor of education from the University of Newcastle. Professor Fischetti has been in the educational field for three and a half decades and is challenging the way we see education. In this episode, following on from my last interview with Professor Fischetti a few months ago, we discussed the changing attitudes to well-being in universities. Hello, John, and welcome back to Wellbeing. Good morning, Jack. It's great to see you. So we talked a little bit about in our last episode about student well-being, and I thought we might get you back on the show to discuss it a bit more. And I guess what I wanted to first start with in today's episode is we we spoke about the how students can balance their uni like scheduled life and um, academic kind of how what what is the uni's role in that? How well are they balancing that for students? It's a wonderful question, Jack, because I think the 20th century expectation was you just worked as hard as you could till somebody melted down, right? It was survival of the fittest rather than it was the opportunity for everyone to have a balance. And I mentioned in the last episode my own uni experience where we went to the first year orientation and the provost at the time said, you know, stand up and then one third of you sit down and these most of the rest of you are going to be gone. Um, and I looked around and said, really, this is your attitude. So I think the good news is universities have come forward with a variety of approaches to make sure they provide a learning experience that's not just rigorous in the sense of you're going to learn what you need to learn, but actually is a place you can enjoy yourself. Some of those are in the accommodations. Most university residents around the world have been refurbished to be places you actually would like to, to sleep and to greet and to be, rather than just, in my day, it was a bunk bed mm. and a dresser that fell apart and a toilet with seven other people. So I think in some ways the environment of where you stay, if you stay on campuses, has improved. And I think the idea that there might be food choices choices that are up your, uh, to your liking, that the library has reinvigorated itself. You know, I wondered once the advent of the internet would come and there were so many online resources, whether anybody would go to the library. And the libraries have never been busier and never been more popular, not because most students are actually accessing things called books. You know, those are the things with covers yes, that have pages yes, in them yes. that we used to read. But actually, they're collaborative learning centers where students can go together to work on projects or to be together or to study in a very positive environment. Environment. You know, back in the day, you couldn't have food in the library. <laughs> You couldn't listen to music in the library, even with headphones. No, 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 no. Uh, and all that's changed. And I think the support that we provide is probably where you're going with that. The understanding that if you do have a question, it's okay. Or if you can't quite grasp the concept, okay. And the peer mentoring and tutoring systems that we have at our university, I think, are an example of that. And I think you mentioned a really interesting topic within that, is that how well is our universities approaching nutrition and the food that's available on campus? Yeah, you know, the, the notion of fast food is basically the, the way in which we've coped. But for most of that, it's fake food. And as students are so busy, most of our students working while they're going to school and rushing, not taking the time to eat right. If you add that to not sleep and maybe a little extra caffeine, you end up in a burnout mode mm. in a couple of times, mid-semester in the end. And that's just not healthy. One of the reasons that I think the campus choices are there is that they're cheaper, but I think now there's multiple forms of different ethnic foods. There's multiple forms of different, they might be fast, but still maybe less sodium and less sugar and maybe more brain food that students can choose. That also keeps people around. And the best part of university isn't the courses anyway. It's the social aspect mm. of meeting people, being in an intellectual conversation, starting up and working inside of a club or a physical a sport, uh, going swimming midday and then coming back for class to surround your day where possible by being being on campus. That sounds very 20th century, but it means you're in a journey, and that journey includes more than just the studying. It's our concept here of life ready, um, which is not just book ready or work ready. Mm. The other part of things is for students that can get scholarships, that buys them some of that time. So for anyone out there who's thinking, you know, I can't, I've got to work so much, really taking advantage of those scholarships could mean you're buying, maybe if you're only on campus Tuesday, Thursday, you're buying your whole day where you can appreciate being around, getting into the library, working with others, finishing a project without having to take it home, maybe going swimming doing some other things that are good for you and building a life around the university, not just thinking of it as a second job of going to school. 
So would you say, John, that when it comes to when it comes to unis, that well being should should be their their focus more than anything else? Not not just the grades, but well being is that should be the main focus. What you said, Jack, I think is a major switch from what the answer would have been 20, 30, 40 years ago, where it might have been an afterthought. Now it's probably number one. Where in, you know might even put it on the list. It's nice if it happens. Um, put it up at the top. When I first went to university, it was 1976. And we had one meal each day in the student cafeteria. And I remembered it was Swedish meatballs like on Monday. And you took the meatballs and we had a contest of how they would bounce down the staircase of our dormitory because they were so hard and so bad. Mm. I mean, it was generic. Everybody ate the same thing. None of it was any good. Most everybody, they call it the freshman five. That'd be five pounds or a couple kilos just because of eating so much junk. Mm. Uh, That experience has changed completely, where the choices are so much better. Um, But well-being is involving the whole experience and making sure people are excited and inspired. The competition out there is really that or a fully online university where you can be in your pajamas all day and do your work or do it whenever you want. And I think for those that are choosing face-to-face, they want that experience to look out for them. And most learners want that personal approach of being Mm. in the space with hybrid alternatives. But if you're going to come to a university on a train, a bus, you're going to walk, you're going to hike, you're going to bike, you're going to drive, you really want it to be an engaging experience and where you feel better about yourself. The other part that increased is the notion that universities can provide the mental health support Mm. and counseling support, which I think was a rarity in the past and exceptional. Now may be more the rule that if during your journey as a student, something happens, you're having a hard time, or there's just a phase of your life where something you need to deal with, that universities provide that resource as well, as opposed to it sort of on the side, it's right in the middle. I call them the speed humps that happen during your journey. Everybody during a three or four year journey is going to have something happen, a loss of a friend or a loved one or a pet, um, the opportunity to have be injured or something which has gone on in the past that's just haunting you. And I think that university provide that support right up front and advertise it shows you're absolutely right. Well-being is number one. And that's the kind of society we'd like as well, mm-hmm. where how you're going actually is, an, is most relevant to what you're learning. And also, unis are quite diverse in their in their age range. Is is that something that unis need to take into account when it comes to well being? Great point. We have students who are still minors. We might have bunches of 16, 17 year olds who have skipped year 12. And we have students all the way through, you know, their career and life cycle. I think that's the one thing we may not recognize when we talk about students. We think of them all as school leavers, but actually the, the average age, and I don't have the current data around Australia, but the average age would probably be 28 to 30, mm-hmm. meaning there's some young people and then there's some more mid-career mature age people who are coming back either because they didn't get a shot the first time for whatever reason, or they're adding to their learning because in today's society, you're going to never stop learning. And I think something that's really important that we highlight as well, John, is the supports available for Indigenous students. What, what are some of what are some of the uh, supports available? Our Indigenous brothers and sisters are so wonderful in the journey that they're on to both own their Aboriginality and explore the heritage of 60,000 years and not give that up at the classroom door because they're coming to a Western university. Mm. And at the University of Newcastle with the Wallachuka Institute, a tremendous support system exists, both for the formal learning with great tutors and mentors, but also the informal cultural component that I think provides the the shoulders to stand on uh, and then the extra nudge needed to get through some of the interesting journey that is going to university. There's, you know, if you're in a semester that might be 12 weeks or so, there's peaks and valleys to that, that the first time you're through just needs a little help. You know, I've been doing this a while and I can see the end of each semester because I've been down that river. I haven't been down it with you, but I've been down that river before and I know it's nooks and crannies. But for a student going through it the first time, four assessment tasks doing a week just looks like an impossibility. And we've got Mm -hmm. students today finishing Mm -hmm. exams that are just completely worn out and they provide support and also for recognition and acknowledgement of the history and heritage mm-hmm. of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So it's a really good point. And I think universities that do that then end up being able not just to say they have numbers, they provide a really good positive experience. You're listening to Wellbeing, a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is Professor John Fischetti, where we are discussing student well-being in universities. 
When it comes to well-being and examinations, how well are examinations kind of meeting well-being? Do we need to change how we kind of go about that? In many ways, examinations have already changed in many disciplines. In my college, which includes the humanities and social science, creative industries, education, business and law, many to most traditional exams have actually moved away from the paper and pencil test. There still are many of those, but most have turned into more action-oriented performances, exhibitions, presentations, moot court evaluations, uh, things which are simulations. Uh, those are really action-oriented. They still have a lot of stress because you want to do well, but it'd be as if I'm giving a presentation instead of a written examination. That means it should be a relevant, authentic assessment. The high stakes are still there in that you want to do well, but there's not that cramming to it. But there are certain disciplines where there's a requirement based on accreditation or otherwise that the knowledge base just has to be there. Uh, but there's, those can still be done differently. You can picture that there are some emerging technologies that will assist with that. It could include mastery learning. You could take a course like anatomy. It's really important that a prospective doctor or nurse knows anatomy. And there probably are some examination components to that you would expect. But the way we do that can use simulation, use virtual reality, use holographic imagery where things can be pointed to as opposed to written and, or written and pointed to. Um, and there's an underuse of the oral exam because you actually master something when you speak it. And a lot mm. of people have incorporated more of an oral component, not just in the languages, as you might expect. So examinations have gotten more diverse, but we still have a ways to go. The pressure of exams, that's the wrong kind, that creates the wrong kind of stress that leads to debilitating anxiety and ill health is the real worry I have for students who take all of that in. Mm. And our high school structure prepares people mostly for whether they can manage stress more than it does about learning anything. So we're in a different era. We're mm. moving in that direction. Some disciplines are already on it. You would expect if you're taking a music class that you're going to be performing something at the end of that rather than a written one. Um, but in other disciplines, it still seems a long way to go. And it sounds like too, John, that that culture of when it comes to examinations, I've heard quite a few few times that some students have this tendency to kind of put their self worth on the on what they get out of that that grade. And it sounds like we're coming quite far in that culture, and we're getting much better at how we kind of go about that. Some of that is Jack, I think, because we believe it's one go and then you're done. And in most things that we have available now in life, if that exam doesn't go as well, you could repeat the course. You could take a different one. You could shift your degrees. Um, there's other ways you could go about it. You could ask for an alternative exam. Uh, our students that have disabilities and those have been documented and they have a reasonable adjustment plan quite often will have an oral exam instead of a written one or performance-based one in, in, instead of one more traditional or given extra time. Because a lot of times I think what you're speaking of is those exams that we've had in the past have all been under a clock. There's very few things except in Mission Impossible, the movies or the old television show where there's a clock ticking, right? Um, most things we get, you and I would have a project to do and we're given a couple of days to do it, but we can work around and get it done when we get it done. So I think the unrealistic nature of the timed component is one where if you're made more flexible, takes a lot of that burden off. I was speaking to a law student yesterday who was actually okay about the exam he has this morning because it's over a 24-hour period he has to do it. Uh, and it's done inside of a portal where he has to provide a rationale and, and go into it. But he's going to be able to use all his materials from the course, and he's be, he'll be able to cite those. And so it seems reasonable that you'd be given a, re, a, t a period of time, but not two hours. Mm. Everything you know in two hours just is too much pressure. And I think most people then fall over under that pressure. Or it just teaches us the wrong things, or it assumes as if only one of us is going to do well. So therefore, only one of us gets to go on. And I think it's a false assumption, again, of whether there is enough work out there that's really good for all of us. And I think that's what we have to overcome is this notion that we're all chasing one gold ring. What if there are enough for all of us? It all look a little different because mm -hmm. we're all a little different. So it sounds like as well that that, that culture of we're not building a culture where only a few succeed now. We're trying to build a culture where everyone succeeds. Is that? It, it, it succeeds in, in the little number a letter of S. Um, in that we want everybody to find their niche and to be successful in that. It doesn't mean everybody was designed to be in that discipline at that time because mm. they just might not be up to mm. it. So there have to be some decisions made that you know it or you don't. It's how do we make those decisions? If it's based on a stressful two-hour, one-off, 60-mark 
out of 100 exam that is a decision. That's the problem. If it's over a cumulative 12 week period, we've been able to demonstrate multiple times you can do it. That one off exam is probably not the one we want to say that determines it. Mm. So giving the opportunity for that, if there needs to be some kind of final thing that it's done where it's really authentic to the business. Having said that, if we're going to pilot school, we want to make sure you know when it's hailing and there's thunder and lightning, you understand wind shear and you're going to make the right decision landing that plane. But the test of that will be when that lightning storm hits, but the exam will be multiple hundreds of times in a simulator. And if 99 out of 100, you can't land the plane, you're not going to fly people. Mm -hmm. We need to do more practice ahead of anything that's that high stakes whether that's heart surgery, whether that's teaching, whether that's something in engineering where we're designing a bridge and we want it to last 100 years. So I think it's about putting people through lots of practice. So the real challenge is why would the exam be stressful if the curriculum were relevant? You'd go in and go, got this. So I think it challenges our pedagogy. That's how we teach. Mm. The curriculum, which is what we teach, because the exam, if you've really mastered all of that, should not be a surprise. Why is it that that's some kind of surprise? So either it's inauthentic, meaning it's nothing that we covered in the semester, so it's not a really good exam, or it's putting you under the pressure that's not realistic for the job or the career you're preparing yourself for, for the sake of feeling that that's rigorous. That's the word I think that's tricky one, isn't it? Rigor means that there's a high level of expectation, and if you meet it, you've done really well. So the problem in we want everybody to be successful might be that we're lowering the bar and to the point that anybody can step over it. So we still have to maintain rigor, mm. but we have to have flexibility in how it's meant and the notion of particularly, since the topic's well-being, do those examinations really measure and have that rigor in the way in which the knowledge is um, understood that you have rather than the experience? How much of it is just you know surviving the experience of mm. doing it? With our human memories being so fragile, also most people do not remember anything that comes from a stressful experience. So therefore, we're probably not teaching so that they'll use it next semester anyway. Mm, mm -hmm. I mean, you, 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 you remember it for that exam, and then it's out the door because you haven't taken it on board to use in a lifetime. So it might change what we do weeks 1 through 12 because we make those really preparation by being much more authentic. So as it's blending that theory and practice and mm. how many of the early experiences at university are very theoretical and not as applied. I think that's the connection. What kind of experience then should the lecturer or the, or the teacher or for the student, what kind of environment to get the best out of that student, what kind of environment needs to be created? There's a funny term that we use when we design a course outline and it's called learning outcome. In this course, you will be able to, and it says what you're going to be able to do at the end of this course. So first is, if you can already do that, you ought to be able to say, I can do that and show that. I can jump up and down three times. Okay, well, we didn't need a course to teach you to do that. I think we often don't have those equivalencies, so people are wasting their time in a course they could have passed the exam the first day. Mm. But in that learning outcome, it should be really clear in each week which part of that outcome, or if there's two, which part of the outcomes you're addressing and how we're going to know that you know that so that everything's connected and coherent. When a student goes, I don't know what we're studying, it means either A, they haven't paid attention, or B, we haven't been made it clear to them. And I think that's almost a psychological well-being of being very, very clear. For those that know where they're going, it's, it's, it's really easy to say, but for a student who's their first time through a topic, so we're going to be studying in this term this, and we've broken it down into 10 chunks. Week one is this, week two, and every week is logical so people can know how to scaffold to those. So, and then I think each check-in, whether that's an assessment or a formal examination, makes logical sense. Okay, now we're going to ask you to present that to a partner, and that'll count for X marks, and you have to submit the following because it makes sense that at this point you'd want to do that, not at the end of chapter three we just have an exam because that's the tradition. So the coherence, I think, is helpful. And for students that feel it's clear, they then feel supported and they feel it's okay then to ask a question. When it's all confusing, most students will feel that they're confused. And I think that's where the rubber meets the road that students mm -hmm. either exit or they go through in a fog. Uh, and I think that's the component that we have to do is have very coherent curriculum and the pedagogy needs to get them involved. I did um, some interviews with students in week three of this semester. They came to our college executive and we asked them, these were first year students, just asking them about their experience 
by week three, first year university mm. students. The courses that they were happy with got them involved in their tutorials week one. They didn't just listen to us talk, they got to do something. And the ones where they felt confused, they hadn't done anything yet. This was the third week. So they hadn't really gotten involved cerebrally in the course. Mm. But if you know you're going from your lecture to a tutorial, where you're going to have to do something, all of a sudden you're invested in it. Or if you're confused, you're going to have to figure it out. So I think it's as simple as our students being very active early in a semester or a term gets them to the point they start to see the connections. If you do that, then you're artificially excited when you get up as opposed to worried, or you don't find that excuse to say, I'm going to chuck it today. You're listening to Wellbeing, a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is Professor John Fischetti, where we are discussing student wellbeing in universities. Do lecturers and teachers have the power to really change students' lives? Every interaction is a chance to inspire, and every comment made whether that's on email or text or in a class, is a chance to either turn someone on or to someone off to their own learning. And the subtle innuendo is just as important uh, as the formal words coming mm -hmm. out. Students have to trust that it's okay not to know, and it's okay that they have a question, but they also have to then be willing to do their part. So if we were supposed to read something for today, and someone comes and says, I'm confused, and they haven't done that reading, there's often a tension then with an instructor who will say, well, you obviously haven't done the reading. But what if that reading was so dense and someone didn't have the prior knowledge because this is a mm -hmm. first year course or whatever? So there often is a disconnect there right away, and that creates stress on the student that, well, is it me or is it that or didn't I try? So it's about the lecturer trying to figure out how to chunk that out. There's strategies that can be used. So for example, I'm going to use, I'll use the word neuroplasticity, which is now fairly common out there in the ethos. Most people couldn't write a one word definition, one sentence definition in their own words of neuroplasticity. They might've heard of it. They know it has something to do with the brain, but they don't really know. So I'm not going to ask you to read the whole chapter for today. I'm going to ask you to read page four and read the definition of neuroplasticity and just write your own, in your own words, what that means. Then I'm going to start off the very first class or the second class by saying, I want everybody to look right, look left. I want you to explain neuroplasticity to Jack. You explain it to John. Now I go back in that chapter and I give you the context of what's happening with neurons and synapses and what it means to be firing up the brain and what habits of mind really are and what neuroplasticity looks like in a healthy and a weak or injured brain. Now for the next class, we're going to go to chapter two and I'm going to leave you to make the meaning of it in these this term here. So all of a sudden, I've got everybody understanding a key term of the course. I didn't expect the reading to happen, but for next time now, I've asked you to do the reading ahead, but I built that bridge for you to say, okay, I got the key terminology, so I'm not as intimidated by this. If we build that bridge, then I think people are more willing to trust to read stuff that's hard. Because if all this was easy, we wouldn't need anything. We just learn it off our phones or, you mm. know, get Siri or Alexa to tell it to us. So I think that's the magic of things is figuring out how to take complex ideas, simplify them and make them accessible. So then the student can go into the next part and feel like it's okay. I'm now not feeling impossible. For those students who already can do that because they already bring prior knowledge, why are they in that course? Or maybe they're a group leader, or maybe they're, you know, I have a little extra piece they can be doing to supplement that with a second reading. You know, it's that funny thing about differentiation. We don't want just the person who's most confused to dictate the pace of a course. Mm. You've probably been in classes in high school where the student who was most out of it ended up controlling the pace mm. of the class. Mm. And that's just where we lose everybody else. So that's the magic of teaching is figuring out if that student's sort of playing in that league or whether those things are actually important because I just didn't explain it. So you pre-anticipate the key concepts, let students study those and not worry because the students right now will not do the reading. Mm because we watch instead of read. We got to bring students to reading by having clever little videos or, or engaging them in some way in which we're doing some activity. And then, then you go back to the reading because people read what they want to read, uh, but they don't read what we, we ask them to read. So why bother worrying about that? Let's, let's start outside of reading and bring them to the reading next. And then all of a sudden they'll do it because it's, they've done it because they feel they can, not because they are worried they won't or can't. Do you have a memory from your schooling days of a teacher that impacted your life, John? Yeah, there's a number of them. Uh, I think most of us do have some negative ones. I'm not going to name names. Many of them won't be living right now, but <laughs> in their memory, I don't want to do that to them. But we know the example of the teacher from uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, if you've gotten a chance to see that one that drones on and on, Bueller, yep, yep, Bueller. Yep. Um, so those are most of the memories we have of time wasted that could have been great. And then there are those handful that becomes those hero teachers. 
most of those were able to challenge us by getting to know us. Um, I tended to not want to do the traditional assignments in class because they just seemed boring. So I would try to find a way to add to it. So I did a project in high school on the rise of television in the 1960s and how it started to influence global mindsets. And the, there was a whole bunch of literature that come out. We were reading all of that. But I put that paper, we had to do a 2000 word essay or something. But I took my grandmother's old tubed mini television set. I just, it was all broken. I pulled out the inside and brought it inside of a television set and turned it in instead of put it in her box. I, I handed her a television and I tried to make things more interesting. There wasn't a lot of incentive to do that. And I don't think we reward that. When I did something about Benjamin Franklin, an American founding father who was one of those that figured out the ability to attract electricity from lightning uh, through a lightning rod. It was a key and a kite at the time. And some of that's fake news, but he, he was actually a pretty clever inventor. Um, we had to do a paper on someone. I did one on him and I put it inside of a kite and got the parchment and made it all kind of old and brought it in a kite. I did that just to keep my myself interested. I think a lot of students aren't as invested in their learning and they just probably were bored and just did their assignment and turned it in or copied it out of the encyclopedia at the time. That was before the internet and nobody was really worried about plagiarism at that time. So I think making sure we spark students' creativity who are there wanting to just add their flavor and I don't care if I get extra marks for that. I just want to have a little fun with it. And each student in their own way might want to wrap it, might want to sing about it, might want to make a brilliant graphic about it, might want to work together or by themselves. Do we really care if they're really learning. So I put more effort into the kite probably than I did the paper, but I really enjoyed it. And I'm here 50 years later telling you about it. And so if we really want to make things memorable. We want to make them personal and we want to make them engaging. And I think a lot of the stuff we do seems just like industrial age, rolling it over, same old, same old. And how do we make it something that you'll remember 50 years later? Uh, that's the part that I'm not sure we all think about when we put together our assignments and our assessments. Well, it was great having you on the show today, John. Thanks, Jack. And I think your focus on well-being, I hope you're owning about your own well-being. Finding that time in the day to bring joy. The things that you love doing, don't give those up. Mine is finding 10 minutes a day to try to do today's Wordle. So we'll find that <laughs> out. It brings me a little joy in between my meetings. My guest today was John Fischetti, Professor of Education from the University of Newcastle. Join us in the new year when we begin a series on anorexia. And if you like this content, check out the Wellbeing Podcast for more. Thank you for listening. I'm Jack Hodgins. And all of us at Wellbeing wish you well.